Miigwech. Merci. Thank you. Thank you, sir. <laughs> to the organizers, um, to the wonderful team uh, that uh, uh, brings this conference uh, alive, and of course, um, to all participants who contribute with their knowledge building and knowledge sharing. I start my day before sunrise, throwing on running clothes and laying a pinch of asema at the eastern base of a tree, where sunlight will touch the tobacco first. Prayers begin with offering asema and sharing my spirit name, clan, and where I am from. I always add an extra name to make sure Creator knows who I am, Firekeeper, a name that connects me to my father because I began as a secret and then a scandal. I give thanks to Creator and ask for Zongidewin because I'll need courage for what I have to do after my five mile run. This is how Angeline Bolis' award winning award-winning young adult novel, Firekeeper's Daughter, begins. And um, the passage introduces the main character, her embeddedness in her Anishinaabe culture, the secrets around her birth and her morning ritual, which shows her determined and very disciplined personality. Readers are also cued to the insertion of Anish Anishinaabe words like Asema and Songidiwin, as well as the manifold cliffhangers that create suspense throughout the novel. The book is a New York Times bestseller, was named one of the 100 best young adult books of all time by Time magazine, and is scheduled to be, to be adapted into a Netflix series by uh, Michelle and Barack Obama's um, uh, uh, film production company, Higher Ground. Uh, it is the debut novel of Anjali Bully, an enrolled member of the Salt St. Mary tribe of Chippewa Indians in Michigan. And in her early life, she worked as an education director in her tribal council and later as a director for the Office of Indian Education at the U.S. Department of Education. This 500 page novel is a coming of age novel, a mystery novel and a thriller with a pretty straightforward um, linear narration and a personal uh, narrator. It propels readers into tr traditional Anishinaabe territory in Michigan on the Upper Peninsula between Lake Superior and Lake Huron and the connecting St. Mary's River. Uh, it introduces us also to the neighboring towns of uh, Sault St. Mary in the US and in Canada and the reservation community on Sugar Island across the river or actually in the middle of the strait um, that connects um, Lake Superior and Lake Huron. The protagonist and her friends are embroiled in events involving multiple murder, sexual abuse, drug abuse, drug rings, and FBI investigations. The mixed blood protagonist, Donis Fontaine, stems from a wealthy white family on her mother's side and from an old established Anishinaabe family on her father's side. Her father was a young aspiring hockey player who was not accepted by the Fontaine family. After she got pregnant when comparably young, Donis' mother was sent to Montreal in order to hide the pregnancy. And her father then married a native woman who had Donis' half-brother Levi, who is only about half a year younger than her. Donis grew up negotiating both cultures, learning Anishinaabe traditions and culture from her Anishinaabe aunt Teddy. And yet she often feels on the outside of the Anishinaabe community, consciously making efforts to learn and to integrate. Donis' father dies when she's young, but she cherishes memories of him teaching hockey to her and Levi. She's very res respectful and she's a very caring person. She visits her white grandmother Pearl every morning in her care facility and she protects her best friend Lily. And she takes care of Lily's grandmother June, driving her every day for lunch, either to the senior center in town or on the rest. Crystal meth is a serious problem in the area, both in town on, and on the rest. The FBI investigates and sends in two indigenous undercover agents, Ron and Jamie, and they pose as a high school teacher and uh, his son, a young hockey player, who tries to immerse himself into the local youth culture. And this is Jamie. Jamie and Donna start, start falling in love, and yet this love is hampered by the investigation and of course by James's false identity and his small lies. When Lily is shot dead by her addicted ex-boyfriend, Travis, Dawn is signs on as a confident, confidential informant to support the FBI investigation against the crystal meth ring. Ron and Jamie suggest that batches of crystal meth circulate in the area with added substances that they suspect to be hallucinogenic mushrooms. 
more girls die. Heather Nodin was last seen at a powwow selling weed and ecstasy. She later washes up on the beach on Sugar Island. And Robin Bailey uh, overdoses on crystal meth after having become addicted through painkillers given to her by her white hockey coach. At the hockey gala, Dawn is raped by a lawyer and hockey sponsor, which is actually the father of her friend. She and Jamie are abducted by the drug people and kept in a trailer in a cave on the east side of Sugar Island. And I will not tell you who the people uh, behind the meth ring um, mm -hmm. are, because many of you might want to read the novel. Uh, so the drug people threaten to kill Jamie if Donis does not help them cooking clean meth, as they know she's a smart ass in chemistry. Donis is able to free herself, herself on the trip to the meth lab, and then uh, she gets the police and F FBI on Sugar Island to free Jamie, while she collapses and almost dies. So this paper will look at the concepts of um, land, citizenship, belonging, and stewardship through the lens of Bully's novel, and hence indigenous-centered lenses. I will set them in relation to established Western concepts of territory, citizenship, and ownership, and property, as they are discussed in indigenous and non-indigenous academic writing. I will not set these concepts in opposition to each other, as all concepts are subject to change and are sources of pluriversal understandings, but I want to see how they are reflected in the novel. My arguments present my own subjective understandings of ideas of indigenous and non-indigenous scholars. And of course, as a German scholar, I cannot comprehend and properly represent theoretical concepts and experiences um, of indigenous scholars and others uh, shared in books and articles. So land and territory. In the process of colonization, all formerly indigenous lands were occupied and appropriated by the colonizer and land tracts reserved for the use of the remaining indigenous populations. Through laws, politics, and respective discourses, these formerly indigenous lands were further expropriated and in general turned into what I call white territories claimed by the forming settler state. So that now usually um, the US and Canada are thought of as white or Euro-American Euro territories and not so much as indigenous lands as they should be. Since indigenous nations never achieved independence, but our colonized nations on their own traditional lands, now claimed by the settler state, of course we speak of ongoing settler colonialism. And I'm really sorry that I repeat, you know, many obvious findings of settler colonial studies, but I just need them as a footwork for my discussion of the novel. According to Glenn Coulthard, oh wait, here we are. Um, settler colonial and colonial relationships are conceptualized as more direct forms or practices of maintaining an imperial system of dominance. Settler colonialism in particular refers to contexts where the territorial infrastructure of the colonizing society is built on and overwhelms the formerly self-governing but now dispossessed indigenous nations. Indeed, settler colonial politics are predicated on maintaining this dispossession. This dominance works through, um, and I quote uh, Coulthard again, interrelated discursive and non-discursive facets of economic, gendered, racial, and state power that are structured into a set of hierarchical social relations that continue to facilitate dispossession of indigenous peoples of their lands and self-determined authority. With colonizing uh, indigenous lands, um, these indigenous lands have been normatized as white or settler colonial territories, have been legitimated by settler colonial laws that define ownership of territories and define indigenous identity. Jody Bird says, and I quote her, indigenous peoples and lands became recognizable as they were conscripted into Western law and territoriality, and then disavowed from the space of actor into that space which is acted upon within the systems of colonial governmentality that continue to underwrite the settler empires. So in our novel, the white settler territories are clearly defined as the U.S. towns of Sault St. Mary and the opposite Canadian town of Sault St. Mary. Um, here, settler geopolitics maintain the border between the U.S. and Canada and the border between uh, the Michigan State Territory and Anishinaabe land, which is de defined as Sugar Island. The border space between the rest and the state is the St. Mary's River that has to be crossed by ferry. 
the river and the ferry being the, tr the threshold between both spaces. The novel presents the US and Canadian border as upholding imposed geopolitical settler structures and as surveilling indigenous border crossers who are subject to racial profiling and racist treatment. So in the novel, um, the indigenous characters um, have more problems at the border and are questioned in a different way than, for example, Don is who is more um, uh, light-skinned. Another settler infrastructure are the many freighters that uh, pass by Sugar Island daily on their way between Lake Superior and Lake Huron and going through the sow locks to clear the six and a half uh, meter drop in water level between both lakes. The cargo ships or freighters are part of an imposed settler economy, disturbing people with their noise, fumes and visible presence, making the smaller ferries wait until they pass and creating waves in their wake that eat away at shorelines. And um, also in uh, the Kanawagi um, uh, 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 community and the St. Lawrence River, you know, those um, uh, freight uh, ships are being discussed in a very critical way as part of settler um, structures. The Solox themselves are settler infrastructure that halt, fence in and control water. Their function of enabling freight ships or freight ships support the settler economy, also destroying natural habitants and fish runs. While having to deal with these in settler infrastructures, indigenous people hardly benefit from them or to a much lesser share than non-indigenous um, people. As donors endures all of these settler structures and adapts to them, she consciously claims the land on the settler side for herself through her five mile runs every morning that take her through her residential area, through the university campus, passing by the dorm building that her grandfather Lorenzo Fontaine has donated and ending at the senior care center where her grandmother Pearl resides. And now a quick excursus um, to um, an Australian context. The Aboriginal scholar C.F. Black describes indigenous jurisprudence and sovereignty over land as in, and I quote him, essential engagement with the land through repeatedly walking the land. It was that act of walking the land of my ancestors that actualized and authenticated the knowledge I acquired. Knowing the cosmological foundation of the law of the land is not enough, he says. One must also experience it so that the law is actualized and realized through a walking of uh, the land. So maybe this is a little bit far-fetched, but I like to argue that running the land every morning has a similar effect. Running and repeatedly putting one's feet on the ground, creating a palimpsest of one's footprints, experiencing the same strips of land, flora and fauna at all seasons, and gaining knowledge of the land is an ontological and symbolic act of claiming the land back and establishing one's personal sovereignty. Uh, Donesis also crosses the river and navigates the border space several times per week, sometimes even several times per day. And she also offers Sima to the river, which enables her to claim that water space and the border space for herself as well. When she searches Sugar Island for um, the unknown mushrooms, uh, she divides it into 30 meter strips that she thoroughly comes through. So in that sense, she literally, literally walks on every square meter of the island and in this way claims the indigenous land as well, studying it and learning from the land. Citizenship and belonging. Beth Piatot argues that pre-1924, indigenous people in the US were defined as legal wards of the government and domestic dependent subjects living under US state control while lacking representation and full rights as individuals. About post um, the Citizenship Act, she says, and I quote her, even after the passage of birthright citizenship in 1924, Native Americans have continued to suffer impaired rights, both in reservation regulations and in voting, which is part of a larger history of American citizenship. She goes on explaining how citizenship was conferred through legal title to land to a uh, part of, uh, um, uh, uh, of indigenous populations through the Dawes Act. And um, of course, she also talks about that it was in essence a policy to reduce um, native controlled land even further. And um, uh, Daniel Heath Justice, of course, has also talked about that um, the other day. Um, indigenous lands were reduced by um, 
100 or 90 or 100 million acres. So they lost more than two thirds of the original territory that, you know, was already, you know, their reduced territory that they control. But in essence, the Dawes Act also was a policy to compel indigenous individuals to shift from notions and practices of commun communal land use and communal, communal land stewardship to notions and practices of individual land ownership and individual property. So they were compelled to completely change their relationship to land. Payatot also explains the consequences of the Burke Act, um, as also David Wilkes, Wilkins has um, uh, done um, here at the conference. So indigenous individuals were only able to keep legal title of the land pieces and gain citizenship by performing Western domest domesticity becoming firm farmers, keeping household and learning English, which she calls um, performative taxonomy of citizenship. She says, and I quote her, a range of domestic practices from animal husbandry to housekeeping to bilingualism produced what I term performative taxonomy of citizenship. The performative taxonomy of citizenship recognizes the construction of citizenship as a set of dynamic categories that are measured against the normalizing gaze of the state. After 1924, Native American citizenship is still loaded with Western ideas and performances of legal citizenship and of domestic domesticity, she says. And yet, as we all know, it has become a very complex set of regulations by the settler state, according to blood quantum, and also additional categories and requirements uh, by tribal governments. So in the novel, um, According to blood quantum and tribal regulations, Donis is not a recognized citizen or enrolled member of the Chippewa tribe because her grandparents have forced her mother not to list her Anishinaabe father on her birth, birth certificate. In essence, her white family site has stolen her indigenous citizenship from her, which she strongly resents. And yet she bridges the gap between citizenship and belonging through her effective and effective interactions with the community. Based on Marcus Lang, uh, Katja Zakowski discusses two aspects of citizenship in general, not only in, in terms of native people, membership and belonging. And I quote her, she understands membership as the formal status as a member of a political entity, most commonly a nation state. And this status is regulated by law and procedures and connected to both rights and obligations. Belonging, in contrast, has a strongly cultural identification identificatory and effective component, even though it might also follow patterns and structure, it is not codified in the same way as membership, and it is therefore much more flexible and subjective. And for my uh, reading of the novel, I'd like to work with this more flexible concept of um, belonging. Donis performs her belonging to the Anishinaabe community uh, through her closeness to her aunt and her family, caring for Aunt Teddy's twins. Uh, she achieves that through her care work for Granny June and other Anishinaabe elders. And she's also taking responsibility for the Anishinaabe youth by supporting the FBI investigations against the mess cell. She also identifies herself as Anishinaabe in her speaking to the creator in the morning ritual and offering tobacco to the river. Most importantly, Donis is recognized as Anishinaabe by the community because of the open secret of her conception, everybody in the community knows who her father is. And second, because of her meaningful relationship to the community that she constantly performs. The community's recognition of her belonging is strongly emphasized when Donis finally files for enrollment in the tribe. Besides needing a blood test and her own statement, uh, she also needs three affidavits from unrelated elders. On the day of her filing the, the documents, in recognition of her support and care work, 26 elders line up and hand her their affidavits and overwhelming support for her. However, now she prioritizes her belonging to the community over legal recognition. And I quote from the text, I've wanted this tribal citizenship ever since I understood that being Anishinaabe and being an enrolled citizen weren't necessarily the same thing. I can become a member, except it changes nothing about me. I am Anishinaabe since my first breath. Even before, when my new spirit traveled here, I will be Anishinaabe when my heart stops beating and I journey to the next world. My whole life, I've been seeking validation of my identity from others. Now, 
that it's within reach, I recognize, I realize, I don't need it. Since also the national U.S. citizenship is hardly important, important to Donis, but her tribal one, she emphasizes a national identity predating the colonial nation state, as Katya Zakowski argues. And Donis establishes an Anishinaabe citizenship of belonging um, that to her now supersedes the colonial U.S. citizenship she has inherited from the settler state. And um, based on blood quantum and proper documentation, and to her, also belonging to, belonging to um, the Anishinaabe nation is more important than her membership of um, the Anishinaabe nation. Uh, ownership and stewardship and responsibility. While Western and settler colonial populations most often define their relation to land through notions of ownership and property, as I've learned, and indigenous people in a traditional sense most often understand their relationship to land as one of belonging and stewardship. One belongs to the land that nurtures and provides one with livelihood, while one has rights and responsibilities towards this land. These include meaningful, creating meaningful relationships to the land, to water, to natural forces, animals and plants, as well as acting as a steward. Most often, indigenous people continue to see themselves as the, as the stewards of already dispossessed lands and assert their sovereignty, as many protests against development of settler infrastructures show. For example, the Caledonia or Grand River land dispute near Toronto in 2006, and of course, um, the 2016-17 protests against the Keystone XL and Dakota Access Pipeline. And this stewardship can take forms of environmental citizenship that Zakowski identifies as not limited to environmental aspects, but as including intertwined, and I quote, ecological, economic, social, and cultural dimensions. In the novel, sorry, in the novel, Donis recognizes her rights to the land, for example, when she goes blueberry picking and in search of mushrooms. And yet she's aware of her responsibility and stewardship as she is focused on gaining knowledge and using that to help her community. She studies the wave patterns, which actually that knowledge helps her finding out where on the island they're, you know, held captive. Uh, so she studies wave patterns, um, she studies plants and their medicinal capacities. She studies mushrooms and she asks elders about stories and knowledge belonging to the land. And this gaining knowledge and giving it back to the land and the community, I think, is also stewardship of the land. Donis will continue to take such responsibility through knowledge by becoming an intern with a traditional medicine program on Sugar Island and enrolling in an ethnobotany program at the University of Hawaii. Enacting stewardship and, and environmental citizenship for Donis also includes taking responsibility for her uh, white grandmother and um, her cultural and mixed community and also her Anishinaabe, Granny June and other elders taking care of her niche friends, uh, for example. The girls are all killed by um, male violence, by drug-related violence and the structural oppression of the settler state. Uh, so this is a clear reference to the missing and murdered indigenous women and girls in the novel. Uh, Lily is killed by um, a man who thinks he owns a woman. Uh, Heather Noden is uh, killed, you know, related to the drug rings and uh, Robin da Bailey um, overdoses. So there's violence through drugs and drug-related crimes, violence related to capital, business interests, and male power, abuse of sports-related power, and there's also the violence of the state not to persecute perpetrators of, cri perpetrators of crimes against indigenous women. Um, Donis develops her, uh, I'm almost done, Anishinaabe citizen citizenship through running and walking on the land being on the water, gaining knowledge about the land and water and establishing a meaningful relation to community and land, taking responsibility for a community on land and performing her belonging to the community and land. And I will um, uh, um, uh, go, go uh, 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 back to what Mishwana Gurman has said at the very beginning of the conference uh, and uh, will quote her, citizenship is given meaning in a spatialized form which really nicely speaks to the novel and um, my reading of it. And I will skip, skip um, Leon Simpson and end my talk with um, Anishinaabe um, scholar Margaret Nodin's motto, Anishinaabe literature is narrative anarchy with a geographic center. Big wish.
Thank you.